Hello, and welcome to Research the News. I'm Ray Abel, and I'm joined by my co-host, Ben Hart. And as always, our mission on the podcast is to have discussions with people we may or may not agree with, but a lot of people we want to learn from and be able to have it in a way that's healthy, fun, not yelling at each other, you know, not like Twitter. So, Ben, you want to talk about the guest that we have on the show today? Yeah. Um, So I agree with everything that this guy says. No, I'm just kidding. Um, (laughs) Our guest today is Kevin Reynolds, who um, he and I are friends and colleagues. We worked together at a marketing agency some years ago, actually doing a lot of healthcare and insurance, digital marketing, which I think will be it would be a great topic for another time of Mm. when we get into the for profit versus nonprofit and or government sponsored healthcare another topic for down the road. But long story short, Kevin and I um, worked at that uh, agency for a number of years. Um, He also at the time was doing digital marketing for political campaigns, uh, namely Democrat political campaigns. Tried unsuccessfully a few times to get me to in the fold on that. Mm. I still may take him up on the offer at some point. But um, I learned a lot from Kevin in terms of the way that that some of this stuff works on the political side. And I think I mentioned last episode, I take a lot of a marketing perspective for a lot of what's happening. And that's simply because at working in the industry and, and Kevin can probably talk to this too, but you see how much you can truly influence uh, really the narrative with marketing, whether it's for a product in a, in the for-profit industry or whether it's with a campaign for a non-for-profit, so to speak. So um, what Kevin had told me about this over the years we worked together and we have been friends since then, I actually was just hanging with him last week in Malaga, Spain, where he lives now. Um, he enlightened me with a lot of what goes on behind the scenes. And so I thought it was great to it would be great to bring him on. He has some great views on some things and can give us sort of a behind the scenes, because I think a lot of folks don't realize uh, how much influence these ads do have on folks, even to ourselves, even the way that the algorithms work um, and the way that uh, campaigns are now harnessing these algorithms. So with all that said, uh, we're going to kick this off with Kevin, just ask some questions back and forth, Ray and I will. Kevin, thanks for being on the podcast. We're happy to have you here and looking forward to kind of peeking under the hood of the digital marketing side of campaigns. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be on and uh, always a pleasure to talk in person or virtually like us. Yeah. Yeah, I'm pretty interested to hear for listeners that are new to the show. I don't have a marketing background, so I'm here with two marketers and also two people who align more politically than I align with them. So it'll be pretty (laughs) interesting to have these conversations and find out more about it. But yeah, I think like what Ben said, trying to figure out the ins and outs of some of what goes on, goes on behind the scenes with digital marketing. And I think since I am the outsider here, if you want to wrap or start out, Kevin, by maybe just mentioning what digital marketing means to you when it comes to political campaigns, what were you working on and what does that term generally mean? Yeah, so digital marketing, I mean, when it comes to campaigns, I would say it, it's basically the same delineation that you would get in, you know, the private sphere as well. So it's going to be the main social media platforms. You know, you have Meta now, uh, but Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, new kid on the scene, you know, Twitter, but really even platforms as diverse as uh, like Google Ads, you know, uh, hmm. running searches that yield paid results for Google searches, YouTube, really any sort of surface that you can think about on the internet, there are likely ads on it, uh, whether you <laughs> notice that there are ads or not. And now at this point, there's ads pretty much everywhere we go all the time, always. I just got a new car and I'm getting ads in my dashboard and that just, I think, went one step <laughs> too far. So yeah, but we'll, we can dive into that one in a separate episode as well. But Ben, I'll let you take over from here. Yeah, definitely. Quick we always like to do the informational questions, right? We did a lightning round at the VP episode. So quick question for you guys. Do you know uh, what year the first digital campaign ad was run? Politically or just generally? Politically, yeah. Oof. Digital political. All right. Take a stab. I am going to say the 
first digital campaign was 2001. And the reason I'm thinking that is because I just remember the John Kerry, George Bush. No, and actually that would have been later. I remember the John Kerry, mm-hmm. George Bush weird a cartoon that they had from Jib Jab. I think it was jibjab.com. Oh, I think yeah. it was before that. That's my, <laughs> that's my guess. Pre Jib Jab 2001. Okay. Kevin. Yeah. I mean, if it's pre that election, you're getting into the time that, uh, I was not very digitally active because uh, I was just <laughs> learning my shapes and colors. Um, but um, he's a younger guy, and I was putting his old yeah. guys to shame <laughs> yeah. here. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. but um, cool, I, Kevin, way to way to start out strong. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I'm gonna guess '96. Let's say. Hmm. Ooh. Not bad. So, the wisdom of crowds. We're gonna split the difference. It was 1998. All right. By Ian clear. Gould, Dang. a political strategist for Peter Val- Peter Valone. Then the New York City Council member charging, uh, challenging George Pataki for the governorship. And it was $100,000, wow. which is a lot. I mean, that was like three infl- with inflation. That's about two to three X at this point mm-hmm. on the New York Times website. So $100,000 on the New York Times website. I wonder what the readership was for New York Times website back then. It's a great question. Yeah. But before that, it was. I hope they got a takeover for that. What's that? <laughs> I hope yeah. they got a full takeover for that. Yeah. <laughs> Front page takeover. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, before that, you'd be advertising in the newspaper or on radio or on TV. And that was about it. Magazines. So this has evolved a lot. And I'll do a quick timeline here for you because I want to get into Kevin talking more about what he was doing. But so that was 1998. And then we know uh, actually Twitter was launched in 2006. Uh, and then the iPhone was 2007. So actually pre Obama, but not really in enough time for the Obama campaign to utilize it in the first term. But uh, the Obama campaign is really credited with the first, uh, time that you, that they utilized digital marketing. And that was much more via Facebook. And then really the iPhone was sort of the outlier at the beginning, but with the evolution of that in social media, Instagram was released at you know, October of 2010. And about by October 2012, uh, the iPhone was mass adopted, smartphones were mass adopted, and we have the social media platforms as we know them today. A lot of stuff has happened since then, and we'll get into some of that. But that's a quick outline of really, it's only been in the past 20 years that all of this is, well, 25 years that all this occurred, and there's been a title shift in what was before, newsprint, TV, et cetera, and is now something that's in the palm of our hands 24 hours a day, or let's say... 18 hours a day if you get Mm. six to eight hours of sleep so something to think about it's also crazy to think that you say 20 to 25 years but 12 years was really the mass adoption and it just seems like so much longer i mean kevin was what three years old 12 years ago so (laughs) ray couldn't let that one go i'm hoping Uh, i can vote in this next election (laughs) you're having so much influence already in your campus Yeah. yeah yeah so with that said in the and also in the balanced, uh, you know, our, our goal to be balanced. I think it would be cool at some point to have someone who's done Republican digital campaigns and also bring Kevin back on. Then we have like a battle royale. No, I'm just mm, kidding. Yeah, but it would yeah. be cool to have, you know, both sides of that. And Kevin, knives I have back- or pistols. <laughs> <laughs> uh, depends on what state we're in. <laughs> so just a quick one. Um, So Kevin Reynolds, as we mentioned, former colleague and friend, uh, volunteer digital marketing lead. I think you had worked your way up there and you can correct me if I'm wrong for tech for campaigns from 2017 to 2023. The mission statement for tech for campaigns is to fight extremism, their words and help Democrats win at scale using advanced commercial digital marketing and data techniques, something Kevin alluded to earlier. It was started in response to the success of the digital marketing efforts by the Trump campaign and election losses seen at the state legislative level by Democrats. So Kevin, I know, um, and there's, we can probably jump right into this, but what initially made you volunteer back in 2017? And I know that did have something to do with the Trump campaign, but just how did you get into tech for campaigns and digital marketing for political campaigns? Yeah. So, I mean, I think like a lot of people who are digital marketers of my generation, obviously on our side of the aisle, more or less, I was activated by the loss, you know, to the Trump campaign in 2016. You know, I was 
fairly unexpected blow. And I think there was a lot of soul searching after that. I was looking for a way to make a difference locally. At that point in time, I was living in San Antonio uh, and there was a mayoral election coming up, which funnily enough, the more conservative candidate in that election, Ivy Taylor, actually uh, worked with Brad Parscale. Brad Parscale is a San Antonio guy mm. and, I, and was, um, for those who don't know, Trump's digital director during that initial campaign. So I thought to myself, hey, it would be cool to go up against uh, Parscale. I was thinking in like a very small role because I think, you know, at that point in time, my thinking was there must be the smartest people in the world on this and like even in local campaigns. And what I found when I reached out and uh, basically went through their like volunteer form and eventually got an email back from their campaign director just saying, hey, you know, I'd like to help out in any way I can. I do digital marketing was, hey, you can run those dark posts that people have been talking about on the news, <laughs> <laughs> the Trump campaign. And I think I learned was, at least at the local level, you know, how helpful it could be to have someone who's more of an expert in digital marketing on in the commercial space, you know, worked on that election basically for free. Uh, and after that, I was looking for more ways to get involved because I think I had kind of realized, you know, the wool would come off my eyes in terms of the fact that a lot of these local elections uh, don't really have the support they need and don't have a digital expert on them and are running on pretty tight, you know, shoestring budgets. And the people for tech for campaigns realized that as well. And so, you know, when I found it, it was kind of a perfect match. Uh, they realized that a lot of these campaigns, again, they have very small budgets. They don't have an in-house digital expert. They can't afford to contract one. And you can make a lot more difference uh, at one of these like state level elections than you can in a Senate level election. So cool. that's basically it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's pretty interesting. We mentioned San Antonio. I thought about Parscale because I hadn't thought about him for a very long time and looked him up when knew you were going to be on the show and saw an interview he did with the local San Antonio news station. And I think for people who don't know, Brad Parscale was a guy has this giant beard, kind of funky hair. He was younger than, I guess, most of the people on the Trump campaign. And he ran the 2016 digital marketing campaign for Trump and then 2020 as well, I believe. And then we won't go into it, but had some personal issues that seemed to stem from some pretty deep issues with family and hasn't really been heard from since that I know of. But I watched an interview that he did, and he said that he had used data in a way that no one in the Republican Party history had before. And he also talked about a guy named Dan Scavino who created social media, Parscale distributed it. And that was one of the things I never really thought of as someone who's an outsider to digital marketing, where I, I actually looked up this Dan Scavino guy too. I'd heard his name a lot before he was on Trump's staff, but pretty unique looking guy. Uh, wouldn't be someone you'd <laughs> picture doing digital marketing. I picture someone much younger and more in fit and more youthful, but apparently he's the one that wrote the posts and Parscale distributed it. So Kevin, do you want to talk a little bit about that? You went against Parscale from what Ben said, you might not be the biggest fan of Parscale. Uh, <laughs> and I'd like to hear more about why that may be and what it was that he did differently for the Republican side of things that both helped them out and got people like you involved in this process. Yeah. So, I mean, I think what he did differently is he brought them up closer to par with the commercial space. So, I mean, mm. Giles Parscale is a San Antonio agency. We had been in competitive bids with them. I talked to him and knew him from San Antonio marketing meetups. And I think it's not so much, you know, having any specific animosity for Parscale other than that he worked for the side that uh, I didn't want to win. <laughs> um, it was just... Uh, realizing that we were colleagues in a way in this space. And I don't think that there was any magic secret sauce, despite the way that he was talked about on the news. He just brought campaigns, which I mean, prehistoric, I would say, in their yeah. media allocation before that, closer to into the modern world. You know, the Trump campaign, I don't know what it was in the first election, but like in his second election attempt, their digital spend was closer to like 40% of the total budget, which, hmm. you know, tech for campaigns, when they did their initial research on like your average Senate race, even as late as like 2018, um, they were spending on average like six to 7%. Yep. 
on digital. And in the commercial space, it's even in 2016, it was above 50%. Now it's probably 60 plus. Well, I know, I know that he mentioned in that interview that he had brought in $90 million to the San Antonio economy, which I think was a humble brag, but he said that was what they brought in from the Trump campaign for the 2016 election. So just to get a scale for our listeners, $90 million was what he alone for his organization got to do digital marketing. Yeah, I think they hit at the right time in 2015, 2016 to where we just did the timeline before of the adoption of cell phones, smartphones, social media, et cetera. They were able to capitalize on that, I think, to Kevin's point, in a commercial way. The other thing is a lot of what uh, Trump was credited for was focusing on the Midwest, which was sort of largely forgotten by a lot of candidates. And so, so a lot of that data... And, and we'll get into more of the data side of that, too, because I think that's pretty interesting with um, Cambridge Analytica and Kevin has direct uh, sort of experience with that. But long story short, that getting that data of all these folks are not being marketed to how to market to those folks. It's the first time you could run a campaign in, let's say, a blue city to the red folks that are living there. I'm using like the colors for obviously for those at home for the political parties. But before you would have to run an ad on a TV station, a newspaper, whatever, they really went to everybody. And this was the first time that you could specifically target folks in a direct way to them. And you weren't, the person next door would never know that they ever saw that ad or it existed. So, and I think Kevin, that was a lot of what you started to do on the local and state level for tech for campaigns, correct? Yeah, definitely. So, I mean, Facebook has since neutered some of these targeting options in terms of hmm. like political propensity, followers of different political figures or news organizations. But I mean, at that time, you really could slice down to who are the people who are likely to be on my team from this area, even if it's 70%, like you said, red. I can just hit the individual people that are likely to be on my team. And I think the other thing that was really unique about this is the two parties are kind of weird agglomerations because of our first past the post system. Not every position within the party is held by every member of the party. And you could find the people who are interested in a specific issue and serve them ads about that issue and not other people who might not be interested in it or might even be against it within the same party. So I think that kind of slicing was also something new that you could do. So you could basically say, all right, Bob in Iowa has shown a propensity to be a Democrat, but he also is for having more access to guns. And so you might serve him a campaign ad that shows like in current times, Kamala Harris's positive gun information as opposed to something where she was trying to ban something involving guns. Is that correct? Sure. Yeah. I'd love to serve him an ad of uh, Tim Walls hunting. <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah. So you can slice it down to that. And I think in a lot of ways, Trump is an interestingly good candidate for that sort of marketing because he kind of throws things out and <laughs> stuff and has a yeah. lot of positions on a lot of issues. And you can slice those up. And I mean, if you think about the way that most people are consuming content at this point, it's in, you know, 30 second to four minute sound bites. 30 second to four minute. I feel like it's more like four second to 10 second sound bites. So, yeah. Yeah, whatever TikTok is. It's been shortened even more on TikTok. Yeah. Um, but I would say at, at the time, you probably had 30 seconds to four yeah. minutes. So, I mean, you, get, you can customize it very much to... Uh, whatever any individual person's issue of choice is essentially and so with the cambridge analytica from can you just give us a very brief overview of what the main issue was there from my understanding they were saying they were doing research into people and then just getting as much data as possible on those people and selling it is that a correct overview and what happened you said now there's some more restrictions and facebook has neutered some of these things what are some of those restrictions that came in after cambridge analytica and was it because of that, that these new regulations came into play? Yeah, so Cambridge Analytica is an interesting one. You got to kind of admire it a little bit, but basically they put together a lot of personality trait data based off of feeding people essentially those Facebook quizzes that uh, were going <laughs> wow. around in yeah. uh, like the mid 20s. Yeah. 
teens. And they tried to target people based off of his big five factors, like personality scores, which actually, in retrospect, I don't know how effective that was, but the issue was that sort of stealthily collecting all of that information on people and then reselling it. So Cambridge Analytica obviously, um, you know, got into trouble about that. Probably the biggest things to come out of it from Facebook's end are, A, the Facebook ad library. So you can't fully target people with posts that, you know, are unseen to the rest of the public. There is a way to look those things up now in the ad library and see what any advertiser is advertising overall. Hmm. Another thing that came out of it that had nothing to do with Cambridge Analytica, but just the election in general, is moving away from allowing you to target based on things like political lane or like following certain political leaders or news sources. You also have to go through a pretty strict vetting process now because of some of the foreign influence concerns in the 2016 election, which is, again, why I now have my credential pulled uh, because I live in a dangerous potential adversary of the United States, uh, which is <laughs> Spain, you know. <laughs> And they don't want us pushing any uh, hummel eating agenda on the American people. Uh, that Iberian ham is so good. I wish they would. It yeah. needs no pushing. <laughs> <laughs> Once you've had it, the Iberian ham is really good. Anyway. So there, there have been some guardrails added in that didn't exist before. The political lean targeting thing, I think, is more geared at just uh, like your average media consumer. It looking like Facebook is doing something about this. Most sophisticated campaigns are using their own media sources and their own voter propensity scores. So really, it it kind of hurts the little campaigns more than anything. Well, I think the thing I learned most from that is something I already knew, which is never do Facebook polls. And I'm just going to throw that out there <laughs> for anyone listening. Also, every time I see someone answering questions about, it'll be a little survey you pass along and it says, what's your favorite vacation? What's your first concert? And I'm like, it's weird that those all match up with the security questions from your password. Mm. So again, just <laughs> don't, don't do any of these Facebook polls. Don't put that stuff public. Yeah, thankfully they changed a lot of that. I think also me mechanism wise, even just to break it down, because folks don't know all the mechanisms you can use. And I don't know what's changed on the political side, Kevin. So correct me if I'm wrong, but things that we can do that you couldn't do before is if you have a mail, you can buy mailing lists and you can feed those to Facebook and Facebook will identify the people on those mailing lists. You can buy those mailing lists from any insurance company, a lot of different major stores, even your credit reports. So like all the credit bureaus will sell information uh, and you can actually still buy a lot of the Cambridge Analytica data from, is it Oracle? I think still has it. And it's one of those. Yeah, I don't know who exactly uh, got the goodies from their uh, breakup, but yeah, I'm sure it's still out there. Yeah, it used to be Oracle, I'm pretty sure. But long story short, there's a lot of ways the digital marketers can use to get exactly to the right person that they want to at the right time. So, and use information that they buy elsewhere if they can't get it from Facebook to target you exactly with the ads that you want. So even though a lot of those controls have been changed or mechanisms have been stripped away, there's still a lot of ways that advertisers are getting to you both in the regular, you know, for-profit space for corporations or businesses or whatever to leverage that, but also in the nonprofit and political space. So just for a little listeners at home, the different types of things you can do and the way that folks can target you directly. So for clarification, you're saying that you could buy a list from a mailing company. Let's go with AARP. Mm -hmm. You pass that through some kind of Facebook mechanism and you can find out the leanings of the people inside that mailing list. Is that true? Is that what, it, what you're saying? Mm -hmm. It's more that you can buy the segmented lists already. You can say, hey, ARP, can you send me all of your Republican voting, you know, if they have that data segmented, and that's the big business okay. these days is data. And they'll send you that list and you send that to all of the Republican, hey, here's a Republican targeted ads or Democrat targeted ads, or, you know, the negative ads have really picked up a lot. And so you then you cross post, right? It's like, let me hit all the Democrats with this negative ad about the Republican and vice versa, you know, that kind of stuff. Hmm.
Yeah, essentially, uh, Facebook has offloaded the responsibility for that sort of targeting. Yeah. So they've washed their hands of it. You can't do it in platform, but there are data providers who will give it to you, and then you can match the list to Facebook data. Gotcha. And to the person that Facebook identifies, yeah. Right. So my question then is, what what is your opinion? So every time I watch a politician speak, the Democrats are trying to save democracy from the Nazi and Trump is trying to save America from the communists. And it's always kind of been a fear based model in some ways, but really over the past 10, 15 years, I've seen a switch into not here is what our policies are. Here is why the other person will murder you, or here's why the other person will send us all into starvation camps. So it sounds like what you just said there, you talked about finding people where you're going to send negative ads to can you talk a little bit about the impact? Is that something that I'm just imagining? Is that something that you see more of where we're going more towards a fear-based campaign? And maybe talk a little bit more about how how that looks in practice. I think that's absolutely the case. The problem is that it's within these platforms, there are very effective ways to run A-B testing. We're constantly mm. doing it. You know, X, 25% of people are getting a negative message. Maybe 25% are getting a positive message. 25% are getting a neutral message and some of them are getting, you know, like candidate backstory. To simplify it, it's actually, it's broken down into a lot more variations than that. Yeah. The negative messaging makes the most money. Wow. So at, at the end of the day, it's uh, at least partially some of the sort of creation of this into a science. It generally makes the most money. There are exceptions to that. I mean, if you have a like a very good candidate, uh, like self-shot video that's about their story, or you know a good like organic interaction that'll perform well a lot. But generally, like, and I think this is a problem in that both sides have learned this, and it's probably driving our uh, polarization to get worse and worse and worse, and then it works better and better and better. You know, it's a feedback loop. But yeah, I mean, it, it, they do it because it works basically. The consequences for it are less if you can pick out a certain group of people and serve them with a scary message and you don't have to show it across the board to where you may alienate some people who are more in the center. So yeah, I mean, that's, that's kind of a rambling answer there. No, it's insightful. No, I think that was helpful. And also, I think there's two kind of follow-up questions. That number one, when you say it makes the most money, is that typically people just clicking on it more, which then gets more Facebook ad dollars towards Facebook? Is that what you mean makes more money? Um, so, I mean, Facebook is kind of more of a neutral player in here than uh, I think the average person gives them credit for it. They don't really care what kind of messaging you run. They just want more ads. Mm -hmm. Generally, they're just trying to give you like more tools and more reach. I would say from the perspective of the campaigns, it makes more donation money usually. Gotcha. Okay. To, to scare people about something that you know, again, Trump said that uh, he's going to come and like take your right to get an abortion or, you know, Biden is going to take your right to own a gun whatsoever. You know, that fear based response generally drives the most donations, at least from what I've seen. The second question as a follow up is someone who's now living in that adversarial country of Spain. <laughs> Do you see the same kind of thing there with elections? Is it moving more towards a fear-based model or maybe Europe in general in your travels? Or is that an American experience mostly? I would say that it is on the fringes. I think because of their electoral system, there's not the same like winner-take-all mentality. They have a parliamentary system. So you do get a wide diversity of parties uh, that can be represented mm. in there. And there's not this like just apocalyptic every election struggle for like 50,000 people in four states <laughs> you know it's again it applies more on the fringes there are fear-based parties here but because they are not like the key voters in a national coalition they can have their own small little party that cares a lot about you know whatever it is immigration or uh, like not wanting to be in the eu uh it kind of stays contained a little more than it does in the U.S. because, like, the two national parties need to kind of feed uh, those ex more extreme people because the margins are razor thin and they can't afford to lose anyone. And it's winner take all. So, yeah. Another discussion for another time about our two party 
mostly two party mm-hmm. system, right? I was trying to let you answer the next question, Ben, without going on a rant about why that was never <laughs> intended to be our system. So I'll just back out of this one. We can. That's all I was saying was just uh, the two party system that we were, we've ended up with. But yeah. uh, for another time, we'll definitely talk on that one. In the meantime, to the digital marketing aspect here. So you ran more at the sort of local and state level. What were some of the campaigns that you ran? What was the impact? And what was, you know, we talked a little bit about at the beginning more of the ad spend on the Trump campaign, which was obviously extremely high. But what, like in fairly succinct terms, what did that look like on a local or state level? So I would say that like local level, the ad spend is much less than you would think. Uh, Like the budgets are pretty low for those. I think that politics in a lot of ways has become sort of a national celebrity game. And a lot of the funding gets vacuumed up to that level one way or the other. So you can make a big difference there. I mean, uh, like both with donations and with uh, digital help. But I worked on everything from state house, state senate, all the way up to uh, like outside of any individual campaign. Um, we had a project basically to drive uh, vote by mail registration uh, through tech for campaigns uh, and prove out if you could do that in a statistically significant way with digital advertising on its own. Actually in uh, Pennsylvania, in our home state, we ended up basically you know splitting control groups from uh, districts that looked fairly similar and just giving half of them the messaging and half not. And uh, we're actually able to track through the state uh, Democratic Committee machinery how many actually ended up signing up for the vote by mail. We're able to have a pretty outsized impact for uh, the task budget before, you know, we rolled it out to more battleground states was only, uh, I think, about like 50 to 100,000. And within those districts, we managed to make at least a... uh, I think it's between a two and a half and a 3% gain in terms of total vote by mail signups, which I mean, when it rolled out to the uh, like multi-state campaign, you could see where that would have made a difference for the 2020 election with how thin the margin was ended up being. Sure. That's interesting. In terms of, you were a volunteer for this, right? You weren't paid for it. The tech for campaigns I know has raised a a decent amount of money, but that funding for the which is interesting to think about when you donate to a politician for their campaign, which people are doing right now. And we know that Harris raised the most of anyone in a single day on the announcement and saying before how much of that those dollars go to digital marketing. You have to think the sheer amount of money that Facebook and Google, TikTok, Twitter, et cetera, are making off of these political campaigns, like a a sizable amount of your dollar goes to a politician, but then goes from the politician's campaign to Facebook, Google might be a great time to buy some Facebook or Google stock. Um, (laughs) It it usually does tend to go up in the the, the elections. And we as digital marketers know and warn clients uh, just as a quick aside that, hey, the cost of running your ads is about to go up in the next three months because it's prime time for the for the presidential election and, you know, obviously a lot of Senate and um, House of Representatives. So there's a lot of money being spent right now. And because it's a bidding system, it costs more money for the rest of the ad space uh, than it usually does in the other times. So it's really crazy to think about how much of your money it's. But unfortunately, right now, it seems to be a necessary evil in the political world of we've got to run these campaigns on these and from that, I'll just um, maybe I'll move into since we want to be mindful of time, the evolution we've been talking about on this. And obviously, AI has come into prominence since the last election. And even this week, the big to do is Trump's campaign or Trump on his I think it was on X, right? Or no, it was on uh, Truth Social, but reposted basically an AI manipulated or generated image of Taylor Swift supporters uh, showing they were going to be voting for Trump, which was not the case that was quickly identified as an AI generated image. So and the implications for that are huge. How much have you looked into that, Kevin? Thoughts on that? The future of digital marketing, maybe guardrails that could be put in place 
for the future in the same way that they did with the last election and the amount of information. Thoughts there? I mean, I think AI is going to affect campaigns in a number of ways, some positive, some negative. On the positive side, I think being able to generate high quality ad assets, uh, like at the local level on some of these bootstrap budgets with AI is going to be a net positive. On the other hand, I do think there's an immense danger of the AI altered videos because there's already an enormous fake news problem across both platforms, not both platforms, but uh, both sides and multiple platforms. I mean, uh, you know, you can see it across Facebook, Twitter, you know, even non-political or political adjacent stories that turn out to be fake. The better that AI video generation gets, I think things are going to get really bad uh, unless we figure out some sort of guardrail in terms of, uh, I think it will have to be on the paid side. I think it's going to be hard to stop organically. But on the paid side, we could at least have like built-in AI detection software in Facebook, similar to how now they detect if you are posting something about a electorally significant issue. And again, we'll try and verify that you live in the U.S., verify that you're a real person. You have to go through extra uh, like account verification you know, ideally they would put some sort of guardrail on being able to upload that sort of stuff, at least on the paid side. I would love if, you know, it could get taken down if it was politically sensitive on the organic side, but then you start to get into like free speech issues. And I mean, at what point uh, are you taking down parody videos or, you know, are you taking down something that I don't know where the line is there. But I think at the very least on the paid side, you could try and stop it from being able to get the reach that it does. And just a quick delineation for listeners when we talk about paid versus organic. Organic is anything anyone uploads to social media. And the paid is digital advertisers paying for it. You can, as a as an individual person, pay to get your post boosted to more people. But when we talk about paid versus organic, it's, it's that. Just wanted to throw that in there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think so. I mean, it's really difficult. So I, I'm in tech. So I'm, this is more of my area with the AI and understanding a little bit about the future of it and where we're headed. And it is a potentially scary issue with some of the sharing, whether it's organic or paid. But I think what you brought up was an interesting question for the two of you being in digital marketing. I've heard a lot about the ad spends and I know you did the, the volunteer work, Kevin, but there's obviously a ton of money in this. I am not someone who wants to shut down any kind of speech, but I do see a big issue with AI because that's, I mean, that's not real speech. It's made up speech that's meant to deceive, but I see a bigger issue with political advertising generally. What I would love to see is no more political ads. If I have to see Bob Casey, who's running for the Senate in Pennsylvania, go on air one more time and hear 30 seconds of him saying, I'm going to drive down prices. That's really boring and it says nothing and it's not helpful. And then you see things from Trump's campaign or Kamala's campaign where they're saying things that are clearly taken out of context. I don't care about any of those. I don't want to watch those. I skip through anytime I can. And I think the issue is there are a lot of people who watch these things and get more fired up. And going back to the negative focus that you talked about before, when you see someone that's coming to either take your guns or take your right to choose, you're going to get fired up. And that's the whole point of these political ads. And what I'd love to see is that a campaign could only put out speeches that they do. I think that's actually the one I've seen Kamala put out a few ads where she's talking about the future. And I don't actually believe what she's saying, but at least <laughs> she's saying things that sound good. And this I, Trump, I don't really see anything from him talking about his policies. It's mostly attacking Kamala or Biden. So, and at the same, same token, I wouldn't really believe what he was saying either. But I think the key there is that if they're talking about themselves and what they're going to do in a way that's beneficial, I could see that being a good ad. But these attack ads, there's just so much mistruth taken out of context, clips that are 15 seconds long that are part of a three hour conversation that are misconstrued. So what do you guys think about that? Is that something that you think is either a potential or something that you could get behind? Or are you just thinking that that would never happen because of the money that's involved in political advertising right now. <laughs> Kevin, go for it and then I'll answer. 
Well, it's something I could get behind, but also that would never happen because of the money involved in political <laughs> advertising. I guess I did a little too much leading in that question. Yeah. <laughs> I do think, though, and this is at least from what I've seen since the pivot from Biden to Kamala, I do think that the people who are running that campaign, at least in the stuff that I'm being targeted with, which is obviously not everyone's feed, we've already talked about that, mm -hmm. have made a concerted effort to put out more kind of positive vision content. And I think maybe that is part of the reason that they're doing well right now. Because I think people are just exhausted of the attack ad yes. stuff. I think we've gone so deep into it and just like, at really from like the second Obama term election that's when i think really the cutthroat strategy came out and i think it's just we've been living in that space ever since and it's gotten so just exhausting for people that i think they don't they tune it out like you do and i think that um people are maybe ready for a change there maybe that's optimistic of me but i think that these things move in waves right you know i i do think that you know this sort of negative focus has kind of crested it and hopefully, you know, it's it's declining a little bit. I think the thing that could be the wrench in the gears there is the AI content mm. because that's something that people can't look at and, you know, say, oh, that was taken out of context or that's uh, like a bad edit on it. One of those kind of ridiculous videos where they play the ominous music over it. That's like, that makes it hard for people to evaluate actual positions. So that's my worry there. Yeah, and I'm going to hear your answer as well, Ben, and I'll just follow up with what you said, though, Kevin, with I think I agree with you that that's when the shift started happening. It's interesting looking back at McCain versus Obama and seeing there was that famous clip where the woman's in the crowd saying that Obama was a Muslim or born in another country. And McCain went over and stopped her and said, no, he's a good man with a good family. And we have different ish different ideas on how this country should be run, but he's a good human being. And then it went from that to Mitt Romney. They told us that he was going to put black people back in chains. So I think it was a pretty drastic change there. And especially that's one of the things that I think from the conservative side, Republican side, whichever way you want to take, I think a lot of these ads just roll off because when you look at Mitt Romney, he's about the most middle of the road, milk toast. whether you agree with his religion or not, he's a Mormon who's pretty focused on his family and he was going to be some kind of weird slave master. So I think at that point, that's when I started tuning out some of these ads and that was pretty long time ago. And now I think they all just kind of roll off me no matter who they're attacking. And I just want to get back to the, the point of what, what the actual issue was. So that's my little rant, Ben. Go ahead and continue with your answer to the question here. Yeah, you could see the momentum gaining at that time period. And, you know, it's pretty obvious Trump just amplified that a hundredfold of going on the attack, even in a way that he attacked other people in the Republican Party, like you know, Ted Cruz. and oh, yeah. We talked about that last week. Not just yeah. Ted Cruz, but Ted Cruz's but wife. Ted Cruz's yeah. wife. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. Uh, and Man, has anyone been more thoroughly defeated than Ted Cruz? <laughs> <laughs> Great point. For the guy. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But um, so that was it. But yeah, I think to that point, people could slide, especially then to what you were saying earlier, Kevin, People could slide under the radar before if you put an ad on television or in the newspaper or wherever, everybody saw it. But now you could what they call dark posting that you said before, you could send this very negative ad to a very specific segment of people and no one else would know that you were doing it. And so it became really insidious and it just amplified from there. Uh, personally, I'm I would be fine. I was thinking the other day, it'd be great if there were no political ads whatsoever. There was just one government website that was set up where everyone put their platform and you went to that website and you read this really sort of cut and dry. Here's our vision for America and the future. But yeah, I think to Kevin's point, as long as there's a dollar to be made and I joke the, the Brad Pitt line uh, from the movie America is a business uh, is my joke and uh, sort of a dark joke, but America is a business and political campaigns are a major business in America. So I don't, Sadly, I don't see that changing as much as I'd love to see it banned and down to just a single website or a pamphlet that everybody gets. So, yeah. no, I agree. And I think part of the problem is the lack of desire for a lot of people to actually research these issues. I feel like a lot sure. of people just, I mean, like you said early on, Kevin, we've gone from watching three hour debates or two hour debates where people were actually discussing issues and disagreeing politely to 
here's 15 seconds of TikTok time. How can you make your other opponent look like the literal devil? And I think I've always, I, I agree with you, Ben. I think going a little bit further than that, if anyone's listening and wants to start an idea that I've had in the back burner for a very long time, I'd love to see a website that not only lists what the, the policy opinions are, but also a history of what that politician has said about those things over the years. So I, I think it's one of those things where now they talk a lot about people changing sides or flip-flopping, and I don't really care. As long as you learn something new and change your opinion, I think that's great. The idea of just talking to whatever audience you're speaking to and, and adjusting, that's not really my forte, but I think having a website where you could actually list what the candidates have said and actually go through and study them, I think that would actually be very helpful. So listeners, Go ahead and get that started. <laughs> you can change democracy. You can save democracy. If you don't start this website, I'm going to go political campaign out here. If you don't start this website, we won't have a country in four days. Hopefully that'll get it started soon. Do you know who has potential, who has the best that I've seen so far of that, Ray? And I don't know if it's true. It used to be was the League of Women Voters. Interesting. They the have L-O-W. Uh, L-O-W-V, actually. Yeah. The, oh, yeah. The, Love. Yeah. Love. Yeah. LWV. So they used to run newspaper ads showing our, our age here. That was just, here's the candidate and here's their platform bullet points succinctly. Uh, and that's been their big thing of like education of voters. So I, I was looking on their website. I don't see as they do have guides. So I'd be curious. I need to look back into that, but it used to be, I used to go to that. I used to like find what the bullet points of the league of women voters for each candidate was, cause it was the most cut and dry. Here's their actual nice. platform. So, but I think, yes, something that's very succinct out there would be great to your point. Yeah. Now, I think with that all being said, I think for you, Kevin, what's something you think most people, we've talked a little bit now about what happens in the campaigns. We've talked a lot about terms that some of us may have never heard before. But I think just kind of in layman's terms, what's something you think most people don't realize about how this all works? What's going on behind the scenes? What do you think is either the worst or the best part or both about what's going on behind the scenes that common people like myself wouldn't understand or know about? Um, From like a top line perspective, just always know that you are probably being served something that you're likely to agree with. Hmm and think about that and why you are. In terms of worse than best, I would say from the worst case perspectives, uh, and you got into this a little bit earlier, at the national level, the fundraising kind of doesn't matter from a running the campaign perspective. It's more from a headline grabbing perspective. An enormous amount of resources are dedicated to spending money just to generate more money. So you win that Mm -hmm. next fundraising headline. Yeah. So I think that, I mean, a significant amount of the cost of running campaigns is like recycling through money and getting more fundraising so that it sounds like you have momentum and then using that money to get further fundraising. On a positive note, and I think this is one where I would delineate even like your idea on people having a site to research the positions. I think that makes sense on a national level. I think on a local level, Digital advertising is actually one of the best things that's ever happened to politics Mm. because these small local politicians, whether it is a council member or mayoral candidate or even, you know, state rep or state senator can reach voters with what they plan to do in a way that they never could before. And honestly, most policy gets done at that level and Most voters are not going to have the time in their day to go home. Uh, I just worked a long shift. Now I got to get the kids from school. Uh, I got to go get groceries. And also let me dig into the state Senate candidates (laughs) and like all of their positions for the past few years. So I do think on a local level, uh, digital marketing has actually been an MS positive and uh, pro-democratic in a way that it is at the national level. So. Try and end on a positive note. We've gone to a lot of dark places here. So, I like well, it. I'm I'm gonna unfortunately just go a little bit negative, but hopefully <laughs> a little bit funny here. Something I I'm fond of saying is that everything in life is a pyramid scheme, 
And I think you just proved that with the fact that you have to raise money in order to get the headline that you're raising a lot more money in order to get money to move forward with more money. So, but I do like the positive ending there. I do think that, yes, I agree that it could help a local campaign. Cause I think that's one of the things that you mentioned much earlier was that it's a much bigger deal locally. And I think when you look at these numbers, I mean, you have millions of people voting for the president every year. And when you look at local campaigns, there's some that you have a thousand people or 1500 people voting. So yeah. I can see from that perspective that if you have a good message, hopefully, and you're putting it out to a place where people can hear it and say, yes, that's someone I can get behind. I think that's ideal. So maybe we just ban political ads for the presidential campaigns. I think I'd be okay with that or Congress, mainly because the Congress ones are just boring. I feel like the Congress ads are either boring or ridiculous and the presidential ads all just make the country hate themselves, hate each other a little bit more. So I will agree, again, someone who's not a huge fan of a lot of Kamala Harris's policies, I will say her ads, they have been much better generally. There are still some of the attack ads, but the ones that are showing the positive vibe that they're the only ones that I've listened to and said, oh, that person should be directing a lot more of these political campaign ads. So anything else you guys have to say before we wrap up here? No, I think uh, I hope that we keep moving in that sort of positive vibe direction. I think we can talk on this another time, but the way that the generations are playing out that I think speaks to that. And you have a younger generation demographic that's moving into the forefront and as tired of the angry old men. And mm. so I think that is definitely playing into that and why folks are resonating with it. So that's what I'll say about that. But yeah, Kevin, thank you so much for coming on. Definitely enlightening to us and I think to our listeners about um, what happens behind the scenes and how much digital marketing and social media does play. We hear about it, but in a day to day instance, now we know some of the mechanisms that uh, we can look out for that are with targeting and seeing out those ads. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, happy to be on and happy to give you a little bit of context on uh, you and all that's come before you, as our <laughs> candidate would say. <laughs> yeah, um, I'm, I'm going to wrap up on a positive note and say that one of the things we're looking at for the future here, I don't think there's going to be anything on this episode, except I might fact check you, Ben, on the fact that the younger generation is more positive and it's the old people who are angry because I think every generation's angry now. So I might fact check that. <laughs> but the point of me saying that is Ben and I talked off the air and what we want to start doing oftentimes on the show, we might be getting into some debates. We've talked a few times now where we've thrown out numbers or thrown out quotations that we could either we could fact check live and there's some things we'll find out about afterwards. So for everyone listening, if there's something that we messed up, feel free to let us know. We love hearing fact checks. Uh, you can send it off to ray at researchthenews.com if there's something we messed up on or something that you think we should have said about a specific topic. And also in future episodes, Ben and I will be fact checking each other if we miss something after the show because there's there's a couple things that rattled around in my head that I Ben said that I was like, I'm not so sure about that, but mm -hmm. I didn't want to address it live because I didn't want to distract us from the main goals. But that's something we're going to be doing because here we want to make sure that, you know, we have a podcast called Research the News. We want to make sure that we're researching and bringing out solid facts. So send those to us. We'll be doing it to ourselves. Kevin, mm -hmm. thank you for being on the show. We loved having you on. We'll get Brad Parscale on here. You, can, you guys can have a knockdown, drag out fight. And I don't know, you seem too calm to do that, but maybe not. Maybe we'll just have a nice discussion. He's much bigger than me too. So I think that's, uh, that's going to go badly for me. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll, we'll do it virtually. We'll do it virtually. It'll yeah. Be perfect, as long as so. we do it virtually, that's fine. <laughs> perfect. All right, guys, Ben, anything you have before we wrap up? No, stick around for the next episode. Our fact check Royale, where I'll have ones for Ray and Ray will have ones for me. Fact check Royale. I love it. All right. Let's thank you it. everyone for listening. Make sure you check out the website for any of the links of what we talked about today. We'll have the transcripts from the podcast and, Feel free to share us on social media as we're research the news pretty much everywhere. So thanks for listening and we'll talk to you all again soon.